So hiya, how are you? Um, thank you so much for being, agreeing to be interviewed for this. I'm good, thank you so much for asking. <laughs> so should we get started? Uh, do you wanna tell um, me a bit about yourself? Sure, I'm Smriti Sapaya. I am based in Hong Kong. So I'm a distance PhD student and I'm actually split between SEI York and the education department at the University of York in their science education research group. So I get to straddle these two lovely departments and learn a lot from each. Uh, they each have their strengths and expertise. So I've been really enjoying that learning across the two. And my, before I became a PhD student though, I have been a teacher at schools here in Hong Kong for 13 years. So that's partly why I'm also still in Hong Kong to do my PhD because my research is based here. And it's about education in Hong Kong, which is the field that I'm really interested in. So what specifically are you researching for your PhD? So I'm taking a look at the appetite that secondary school students have for environmental activism. And I'm especially looking at it through an experiential education approach called citizen science. And it's something that has only really started in Hong Kong, I'd say seven and a half or eight years ago. And it's not even that pervasive across the schools. So I was quite keen to test as much as one can test the impact of these kinds of experiences on students in a bit more of a um, qualitative and quantitative way, because I've been trying to incorporate citizen science in my teaching for a number of years. And anecdotally, I could see the impact. But when I was looking into the research there hasn't been that much done about it, even globally. So I was quite keen just to find out more and it's never been done in Hong Kong. So I was quite keen to just answer a burning question of my own. At the end of the day, I think teachers just wanna be better teachers so that what they teach and how they teach has a greater impact on their students. So that's where the whole, uh, the, yeah, I'd say the source came from in terms of the question and, and why I'm doing what I'm doing. That's really interesting. What did you study previously to then get to the point where you're now doing a PhD? Oh, it was a bit wonky. Actually, I never wanted to be a teacher. That might be a common story for some teachers. Uh, I was really keen on research. I was a, a geography science kind of kid. And so I did geology as my undergrad in California and was really interested in a lot of the earthquakes that were happening there. So I then did my master's in Hong Kong U, the University of Hong Kong, but I've always been a mountain person. So I found out that they had a Tibet research team. So I was like, yes, let me go. So my master's was about earthquakes in Tibet. And you know, I was kind of happy down the research road, but then there was some stuff that happened in the news that upset me a lot and it had nothing to do with earthquakes and it was more um it got me questioning what the point of my research was and if I was thinking about doing more research in that field would it have any kind of impact and be helpful to society and my conclusion at that time was that I don't, I don't think so and so I thought well what would be useful and at the same time I had to do a lot of the field courses for undergrad students as a master's student we would lead those and I realized I enjoyed working with young people in the field so I'm a big outdoorsy kind of person and so suddenly I was realizing wait I think I like this thing that I'm just slowly discovering and so then I decided maybe I'll go get a teaching degree and so that's where the teaching thing came from so I initially was doing a lot of science teaching and then geography teaching a lot of environmental education so I was able to kind of nerd out with my students about earthquakes and geology and rocks as much as I could, but then I also had to bring in all these other things, um, which has been a lot of fun. So that's kind of the 13 years of teaching suddenly flew by and I still try to do as much field-based work as possible, which then led to the citizen science and then getting me to question, well, how impactful is it? Does it change student values towards the environment? Does it change their behavior? Are they becoming a little bit more active with being mindful and wanting to protect the environment. So all these kinds of questions kind of came from there. So it was a bit mishmash and windy, but I eventually got here. 
Amazing. So the final bit of the, the get to know you section of this is the most important. Um, what is your favorite color? My favorite color? Mm. Ooh, uh, gosh, dang it. It's, so, I don't know. It's like a, a greeny bluey mix. Is there, a, I don't know what the spectrum <laughs> of colors is, but yeah, it's like a mishmash of green and blue. Okay, okay. Right, we'll go back to the um, the environmental-based questions. <laughs> I like the, the most important being the color stuff. <laughs> so what attracted you to SEI in the first place? What made you apply for, for this PhD program? Well, SEI, I've been sort of tracking SEI for a little while, partly because even in my teaching, we're always looking for resources with information about well, a lot of environmental uh, information from from the geography side of teaching, but the, there was reports and data and a lot of global data too that was coming out. So I, I was introduced to SEI that way. And I was thinking there is this organization that seems very trustworthy in terms of data collection and the kind of interpretations they're doing, but also the way they're applying the information that they have to create change that's positive for people and the planet. And there's not too many organizations that do that, it seems. Effectively, maybe, is another <laughs> adjective I should add. So they were on my radar, but I had no clue about PhD opportunities. And it only happened much later when I was looking into citizen science and trying to understand, well, what do we know about the impact of it? Where I then found out that there was a particular researcher or a few researchers in that world. And they were doing really good work and it was coming out of SEI York. And I was like, hey, wait a second. I, I've heard of this group before and they do really cool stuff. And wow, they have, you know, people working on citizen science and there's a PhD opportunity. So I was just thinking, wow, these worlds are colliding really nicely. And so I think I got really lucky that way, recognizing that they're doing work that actually has real impact. And a lot of times it's not as an outside researcher kind of coming in. They build a lot of relationships with people locally and often lead, let them lead that kind of project, which I, especially with the whole citizen science aspect and interest that I have, uh, local voice is, is really important to me. It's kind of the same reason why I think student voice is also really important in anything that teachers ever do or schools ever do. So that philosophy was also something that connected with my philosophy and I, I valued that. So I think there's some similar values. And so I, I appreciate their approach and I like the, the impact that it, it can have. And they're very humble about it, but also very explicit and hopeful. So all of those things I thought were, were fitting in with what my hopes and vision was too. Nice. So what's your experience been like studying here so far? I have pretty, I have stepped foot once into the SEI office and literally that was for about five minutes and I realized that the person I was supposed to meet was sick that day and I never managed to meet them. And so I basically walked in and then walked out <laughs> once I found out that. So I physically don't have much of an experience there other than um, just being in the building for some minutes. But being a distance learner, I... I think, and this was pre-COVID, I had chosen to be a distance learner. So things were, I think, not as easy as they are now because everybody has to live and work and study online. But I have to say that as soon as I kind of joined the SCI family, I was suddenly part of so many emails that was all about community building and even though we've physically never seen each other, it suddenly felt like a little family. And there were some people, especially from the admin side who went out of their way to make me feel super comfortable, check in with me on a weekly basis, uh, invite me to talk at speed talks and just get to know me too. Uh, just little itty bitty things like that. So I thought that was really precious and helped to just really like you get thrown into the deep end, but this was like a nice cushion to have in, on your entire journey. And nothing has changed. In fact, it's gotten even cozier and there's more ways to engage and participate. So it feels 
it feels really special. I've, I've never had anything like that in the previous three degrees that I've done at three different universities. So this feels very different and very, very uh, unique. That's really nice to hear, actually. Yeah. Has yeah. there been a, um, a standout experience for you? Standout experience? Um, uh, I don't know. It would be hard to say, partly because I've not been able to join some of the uh, the very social things because those tend to happen UK evening times, which ends up being often my 2 a.m., 3 a.m. So I'm, I don't end up joining those. But I hear afterwards that they're a heck of a lot of fun. And so I know I kind of missed out. But there's other uh, small opportunities. Uh, I mean, I think they had there was the Christmas one that I was able to join, which had a bunch of different games, really, really wacky kind of games that I'd never thought you could do over Zoom. Uh, I thought they were really clever. And so that was a lot of fun, uh, a lot of giggling, a lot of silliness. So I'd say, yeah, that. but I hear there's lots of those. So I'm, I'm really appreciative that I managed to join that one. They had a, had a friendlier time zone for me. So I really appreciated that. And actually, I should say, there are lots of times when they check in with those of us who are in different parts of the world about can we join and I thought that inclusivity was was special so like we're not forgotten even though we're not there yeah that's really nice so if you were to summarize SEI in three words what would they be uh, <laughs> um oh goodness hmm and I mean this in the best way possible there's an eccentricity about them about people in this group um oh wait oh, dang it i was going to use a transformers quote of more than meets the eye but that's more than three words uh dang it um okay so so there's a, yeah there's an eccentricity but then um there's a there's a humility i would say as well and um and a, yeah great intelligence those three things i'd say yeah nice so the the final thing we're going to be doing is um mm. if you were speaking to somebody who was thinking about applying to do a phd here what would you say to them i would say that would be a very smart choice to to do that there is tremendous support from not only your supervisor, if you have just the one, although I hear that many people have more than one, I've got more than one, but in a different department, but there's a lot of breadth as well as depth in SEI. And I find that there's a lot of willingness to help you in that journey, whether it is with maybe quantitative skills or qualitative skills that are or maybe methodological or analytical. There's a lot of help. And it's not just coming from the, sort of the, the experts, but it's also coming from the, like the postdocs and then other PhD students. There's a lot of communities that are really helping in all sorts of ways. And not just the sort of technical side of the PhD, but even the social emotional side of trying to get through a project that can hit a lot of bumpy roads, especially during COVID times. So I feel like, you know, the SEI is in, would, would be the, you know, the perfect family to do a PhD and stumble along the journey and figure it out as you go along. So I think it would be a smart choice to, to consider SEI as the place to do the PhD. So would you have any advice for those applying? Is there anything that they really need to know? Well, it wouldn't hurt to really have a good sense of your own project, whatever that research question is. And in a way to, I mean, I know you have to write a, a bit of a proposal and to have as much in that proposal as possible. I'd say one of the, the things, especially perhaps in the last two years, what that's taught us is to have plan Bs and maybe plan Cs and to have thought about that and even have some kind of mitigation plan. 
because that also shows your potential supervisor that you're thinking about how to be adaptive and that shows some innovative thinking that shows some creative problem solving and these are the kinds of skills that you'll need as you do your PhD anyway so if because I think everyone generally who applies has the basic here's my question here are my general methods I would use here's possibly the way I will analyze it and maybe here's some literature about the topic but if you can show that if things go wrong, because likely things won't go perfectly, then here's what I'm gonna do about it. And those kinds of skills are, I think, going to put one in good stead. That's really good, really good advice. Um, these are all of the questions that I have for you right now. Is there anything else that you would like to mention? Anything else you think we've missed out? Um, I mean, Hopefully everything can be face-to-face -face and, and physical again. And it seems like this, I mean, SEI as part of the environment and geography department, it's, it's a great space because SEI is such an amazing culture. And then even the environment and geography department has a great culture. So it's almost like you're part of two worlds that are happily coexisting and mingling together. And it makes for such a supportive environment that your PhD experience would be just so enriched by it. So, uh, you know, if, if people are questioning whether or not this would be a good decision, I would say you don't even have to question. It's just a matter of, well, just be open to the wonderful people that are part of SEI and in the environment geography department. And you'd, yeah, I'd say you'd be hard pressed to ever find anything other than just really positive, meaningful relationships and experiences. So yeah, hopefully it can be face to face because I hear I'm missing out on some really cool things like picnics and hey, who's some amazing goose out there. I don't know, there's, there's all these cool things and mysteries to solve. <laughs> so one day, hopefully I'll even get a chance to, to be there. But I think those who get in are super lucky. So apply. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much. You've been amazing. Oh, you're very welcome. Thanks again, Lucy.